Jamie, you, you just told us that we should link the armed forces to what they're great at. If you link a conference from the perspective of somebody who organizes it to something that you're good at, you're always in safe hands. Thanks for putting a whole conference into a short speech. Um, this was very uh, impressive. Um, let me um, uh, switch now and move on because we're already slightly over time um, to uh, General Bartels, who agreed to speak to us here today, give us a short intro um, from the military perspective. Um, General Bartels is the chairman of the military committee here at NATO, and he comes from a country that has done a very impressive strategic shift of its own since the end of the Cold War and has turned from um, a very reluctant Cold War partner to a very, very activist post-Cold War partner, and uh, there are many lessons to be learned from your example, from your country's example, and I'm sure you have some important lessons for us today. Thank you very much, General. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to say a few words about why defense matters. Now, of course, the critical person in this, in this very room will probably say, what else can you expect from a general? Well, let me offer to you that I would also expect a journalist to talk about the freedom of speech, and nobody challenged that. So let me offer to you some reflections on why defense matters. I would like try to walk you through a short assessment of where we are living now and what we can expect in the future. Since the collapse of the Berlin Wall back in 1989 and the, the end of the Cold War, we have been faced with one crisis after another in the world, and most of them have come in an unpredictable way. They often came without warning. They often changed nature during the development of the crisis, and it does not seem to be ending just because we are talking about downsizing our contingent in Afghanistan by the end of 2014. Could I just highlight what is going on in the so-called MENA region or the Middle East, North Africa region for the time being, which has strategic implications for at least a substantial part of the world, not the least the one in which we are living in those very days. Could I also say that when we are talking about a NATO which is repositioning post-2014, when we will be leaving Afghanistan with a major part of our forces, where we then will have to do something new, we will be without an operations. Are we going to be without an operation? I do not know. I will not try to predict. But I can only say that not much has been predicted about the crisis we have been going through, and often we had to react at very short notice. So my bottom line is, as a first conclusion, is that we are facing an asymmetric world a world where actions do not, low, do not develop anymore along the lines of state versus state, but very much an asymmetric world where the state, represented not the least by the armed forces, often finds itself confronted with a very different kind of situation in the lack of using the word threat. My next point is the nature of conflict. Well, here I think again we have a dichotomy of a number of uh, factors when we talk about the conflict, the nature of the conflict. Yes, the days uh, of the conventional battle as we experienced them during the two world wars and a number of conflicts afterwards might be over, partially over, or might not be over. But we have also seen other dimensions to the conflict, the counterinsurgency operations, the comprehensive approach, and all what is required to deal with the many crises we are facing uh, today. On top of that, I would add a couple of remarks. One of them is that the soldier who is sent out in the field is facing two fundamental factors. The first one, as the British historian Michael Howard said very clearly, the last 20 meters remain the last 20 meters. The soldier charging during World War I against the German trenches or the soldier charging during World War II against an enemy position. And the soldier, whoever it was, charging the Taliban position in, uh, in any part of Afghanistan experienced the same thing. The last 20 meters haven't changed. You expose yourself, you engage into combat, and you might not survive it. The other dimension which the soldier of today is faced with is the oversight introduced by the media of the 21st century. Very little is unknown, 
Very little takes place without being spread to the rest of the world, and therefore there is a sense of accountability which did not exist before. Fundamentally, I agree with it, I understand it, but we should also reflect about the consequences it has on the fighting man or woman who is at the very spearhead of our ongoing operations. So, an unpredictable world, an unpredictable battlefield where the soldiers face many various challenges leads me to ask the questions relating why does defense matters? Well, I would like to reverse the questions. What's the price of not having a defense which matters? And I think we need to reflect upon that and to look at the consequences. Now, Jamie Shear, with his usual eloquent way of presenting things, has touched upon a number of this, and therefore I will not go as much into the details of it, but I will just highlight that the consequences of not having the tools which can pick up the challenges can be much more daunting and catastrophic than funding the tool which is necessary to be able at least partly, if not fully, to face the challenge. Now, I also alluded to the fact that by describing the crisis we are facing, there is no specific threat. No. And I do not share the perspective which was highlighted by Jimmy Shear about the Russia academician traveling around and saying, you have lost your threat. Well, the threat was more specific during the Cold War, but fundamentally the threat is still there. It is, as I said, asymmetric in an asymmetric world. So how do we deal with this when we look at post-2014, which has become quite a key date as to the future of what we are belonging to, at least I as chairman of the NATO Military Committee, which is the alliance. There is no doubt that we are facing the possibility to be confronted with what we call full-spectrum operations. The next operation which is going to take place, regardless of where it takes place, is, can be anything from a short high-intensity operation, a counterinsurgency operation, a humanitarian operation, you name it, you have it. In other words, it will be essential for our armed forces in the future to be prepared to be able to handle, to get a grip on whichever situation they're going to be confronted with. And I have a perception, which is based upon a long experience as a soldier, that they've said, you know, the silver medal on the battlefield doesn't matter. There's only one medal on the battlefield, and that's the golden medal. If you don't get it, you have lost. So we better make sure that our armed forces, regardless of what they're going to face, be ready to face up to the challenge, to do it speedily, and to be able to adapt at a very high speed, because they're going to face an adversary who will adapt to what we are able to do. We have been doing this as an alliance of 28. We have been doing this as an alliance of 28 plus numerous partners. We need to keep up what has become one of the great lessons learned from Afghanistan, which is our ability to operate with each other. That's why it has been launched by the, uh, the alliance, the uh, Connected Forces Initiative. It is absolutely essential that not only do we keep up our skills and be ready to do what I have just described, but we also be ready to do it together in many different configurations. That's why it's so important, as Jamie Shear said, that we need to be very clear why we exercise, how we exercise, and where we exercise. And I think we are getting much better at doing this. And as I said, we should do it with our partners. Our partners not only bring military value to us, which is, of course, a very important dimension, but they also bring a much broader legitimacy as to what we are doing. And finally, if it is part of from the region in which we are operating, they bring us a knowledge which we might not have or which we only have in to a limited extent, which means that they go and play an, an essential role. Finally, when we are talking about uh, our future operations and what our forces should be able to face up to, and in the relationship of defense matters, and budgets might not be what we like, and budgets, by the way, are never what we like, regardless of we are military, health services, uh, road services, infrastructure, and whatever. We would also like, always like to have more, not to say much more. But then we'll have to get serious at the whole smart defense 
acquisition, or the way we deal with acquisition of equipment for all armed forces. So besides making sure that we address the training of our forces as to the future, making them responsible to a full spectrum of operations, and making sure that they are connected not only among the Allies but with all their potential partners. We also need to make sure they are properly equipped. Let me just highlight a nightmare scenario. The NH-90, which, by the way, was supposed to be flying in the 90s, operationally speaking, which is a helicopter, which is beginning to become operational today in 2012 and 2013, has been produced in more versions than nations buying it. That's not good use of taxpayers' money. And what does it have as a consequence? You get fewer. So that's not the way to do it. We also have to get close on equipping our forces and equipping them in an appropriate way and thereby keeping down costs and making sure they get what is necessary. If we do all of this, and I'm convinced we will do it, even though it might lead to some grinding of teas and a bit of tears being shed here and there, when we do it, we will be able to give to our populations, to our political masters, the tools which will make it possible for them to face the situation they will face in one way or another and which today we do not know. So bottom line, defense does matter. And I would finalize it by saying, as Clemenceau, who was also mentioned, Prime Minister Clemenceau expressed once, war is too serious a matter to be left to generals. I agree. I would say peacetime is too serious a matter to be left to ministers of finances alone. And finally, I would again quote Clemenceau by saying, by the way, is peacetime an interlude between wars or are wars interlude between periods of peace? Defense does matter. Thank you very much. That quote about the finance ministers is going to get on Twitter very, very soon, I'm sure. Um, thank you very much, General. Thanks for, for, um, for kicking this um, off uh, in the second round. We're now going into the first panel, and I'd like to ask uh, Judy Dempsey and her panelists to come over and, and populate the podium. Um, Judy is going to moderate. She is a senior associate at Carnegie Europe and our chief blogger for the Strategic Europe blog, and I'm sure that um, she's going to guide us through this debate in the next uh, 90 minutes. Uh, Judy, thank you very much. Just getting them settled here, Jan. Let's end here. Well, thank you very much, Jan, and thank you very much for inviting me to moderate this excellent panel. We have, um, we've, the, the standards have been set very high, I must say, so I'm sure we'll set them very much higher over the next hour, hour, hour and a half. Um, I just want to briefly uh, say two things. The speakers have been, I was going to say advised. <laughs> They've been ordered. <laughs> to, since this is about NATO as well, you have to follow certain commands and orders. Uh, they've, been, uh, they've been ordered to speak five minutes only. And the whole idea is that um, this is, the whole purpose of this panel clearly to deal with the question, but to really involve the audience and to find out the kind of thinking, I mean, wh what is the, the kind of um, public thinking, private thinking, institutional thinking, political thinking, op uh, opinion and, uh, of, of defence, does it matter, defence matters. So the more participation we can get clearly, the, the greater the... The greater the debate, and uh, I, can't, um, I can't guarantee that we will come up with um, really full answers to this, but this is the whole nature of the discussion. And so, without further ado, I would like to ask our first speaker, um, Ludwig de Camps, um, uh, from NATO, a senior fellow and um, a director of armament and Aeros aerospace capabilities, director of defence investment division in NATO. I was going to say the floor is yours, the podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Ladies and gentlemen, Chairman, good afternoon. Uh, I will share some observations on why I believe defence matters, and I will provide these observations from my professional experience as an international staff member at NATO headquarters uh, in charge of trying to seek consensus or build consensus among nations on how to develop capabilities for the future. And against uh, the background that was already uh, briefed about less predictable future 
challenges and declining defense budgets, I think there is a general understanding that we need to uh, address capabilities today in a, with a new level of multinational cooperation. But how to design that new level of multinational cooperation, call it smart defense, pooling and sharing, or whatever, is still very much uh, uh, a matter for debate at NATO headquarters. And it struck me that reading the reports on defense matters, that all, a lot of elements that are present in the public debates are also very much present at NATO headquarters in our debate, because nations do not necessarily share the same threat perceptions, uh, they have different domestic situations. The defense industry uh, is quite different in shape and form and in their relationship towards the civil society and so on. So I think that a lot of elements that pop up in the external debate are also very valuable and valid in the internal debate. Now, in the chapter on recommendations on the way forward on defense matters, the study proposed to change the, the, or the pivot of the discourse from cost to value, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, but uh, how can we do this? Uh, let me share three observations on this. The first one, I believe, is we need to explain that defense matters, because indeed we are faced with an unpredictable world, and that defense, therefore, caters for preparedness. This had been mentioned by the previous speakers, because I think that most people will agree that both the nature and the occurrence of uh, security events or security situation, threats you may call them, uh, are quite unpredictable. And that therefore, NATO as a security, transatlantic security concept is much more than providing security assistance in Afghanistan and in the Balkans. So we ex explicitly need to focus on those situations, I believe, that leave uh, little or no margin for improvisation uh, as uh, if they uh, materialize. And you could think of proliferation of uh, missile technologies or proliferation of autonomous uh, systems and so on. So really things to deal with major situations that Jamie Shea mentioned in his uh, introductory remarks. I think that we also need to better explain the role and the position of our defense industries. Because I believe too often we are looking at our defense industries as just providers of military equipment. But actually, they are very much part of our economic and technological capital of our societies. And hence, the role of defense industries combined with, with military force uh, cannot be uh, overestimated, I believe. They're very much part of a nations and our nations and our alliance preparedness, but also resilience in dealing with unpredictable situations. And then my third element is that defense matters because it's an integral part of international cooperation. And we have seen that immediately after the Cold War with a very successful Partnership for Peace program. And we see that today in Afghanistan as well, where part of the mission is to build Afghan national security forces that can deal with the domestic security situation. And therefore, I believe that this notion of cooperative security that is now part of NATO's strategic concept is very much at the heart of the debate of why defense matters. So basically, summing up, uh, three main items that I would like to bring into the discussion. Uh, defense is there because it ensures preparedness uh, for a rapidly evolving and unpredictable world. It is an integral part of our economic and technological capital and is a platform for international and multinational cooperation and stability. And these are, I would submit, three important reasons why I do believe that defense matters. And I also think these are three important reasons why also NATO will continue to matter. Many thanks. Uh, Ludwig, thank you very much uh, for this and for keeping within the limit. I'm very, very, very grateful and um, kicking it off to a very good standard. Our next speaker, coming from the United States, welcome to Brussels. It's Jacob Stokes, Research Associate, Centre for New American uh, Security. We're delighted to have you here, and it's all yours. Thanks very much, Judy. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks to Carnegie Europe and to, uh, to NATO for sponsoring this important conference. Um, before I begin, I'd like to uh, quickly recognize my colleague, Dr. Nora Bensahel, who worked with me on this project uh, and is also the co-author on our paper together. Uh, today, I will very emphasis on very quickly speak about four topics. Um, basically, my paper or my presentation assumes that defense matters. I don't think I'm not sure that's going to be much in dispute today, um, but it really focuses uh, mostly on, on this, uh, the U.S. strategic context and, and kind of how we can make that case, uh, particularly for NATO there. So um, first I'll talk about the, the strategic context, as I said. Second, uh, I'll talk about the state of public opinion in the U.S. regarding defense spending in NATO. Third, I'll offer some ideas on how to improve NATO's capability at, at some minimal cost. And finally, probably most importantly, I'll suggest some ways to demonstrate NATO's utility to U.S. policymakers in particular. Let me begin with the strategic context in which this debate is occurring in the U.S. Basically, two big picture trends are driving this debate. The first trend is the likely significant decline in U.S. defense spending over the next decade. After a, very, a period of very, very high spending over the last 10 years, over the next decade, if current law stays in place, defense spending will fall 33 percent in real terms. To be sure, these reductions are from a very high watermark, but still, there will be a, crunch, uh, a cash crunch in the Pentagon. In fact, it's already well underway. In addition, both the size and structure of those sp uh, spending reductions will mean deep cuts to modernization and procurement accounts, since these are among the very few budget lines where savings can be realized quickly. The details are, are maddening of the specific legislation, as, as anyone who follows the U.S. Congress uh, can tell. Um, but I'm happy to talk more about them in Q&A if anyone is interested. Um, the second trend is the U.S. policy of rebalancing to the Asia-Pacific region. A lot of you have heard about this. Basically, by 2020, 60 percent of U.S. naval forces will be focused in the Asia-Pacific region, up from about 50 percent today. The size of American land forces are also being reduced. That will mean fewer troops in Europe to conduct exercises, all the U.S. officials have agreed to contribute an Army Brigade to the NATO Response Force for the first time as a signal of the U.S. commitment to Europe and to NATO. So that's the strategic landscape in the U.S. Where is American public opinion in all this? The picture is somewhat mixed, but overall fairly positive. While Americans are split uh, about the proper size of the defense budget, they do want the U.S. to be an active global power, even if they're dissatisfied with the way the U.S. has been conducting world affairs over the last decade. For NATO more specifically, 55% see the alliance as still essential to U.S. security, and that number really has held more or less steady since 2002. However, truth be told, most Americans don't really have a strong view about NATO one way or another. The level of knowledge really across the population remains very low. Even among foreign policy experts in the U.S., few really know that a four-star NATO headquarters is located right in Virginia. Probably more important, though, for those who do know about NATO, Views of the alliance generally focus on a lack of burden sharing among allies, and Libya really brought this home to the U.S. policy community in a big way. So how can we improve, the, uh, improve this picture? Before I get to the messaging part, let me talk quickly about the policy. Um, the policy really must come first and foremost. Messaging is necessary, uh, but not nearly sufficient. In the end, good policy mostly sells itself. I have a quick list of policy recommendations NATO should focus on in order to make the most of the capabilities it already has. Uh, we make seven of these recommendations of our, in our paper, but uh, and for the sake of time, I'll just uh, point out two uh, that I think are particularly interesting um, here. First, I th we think uh, NATO should expand the 2% of GDP metric for defense spending to include a more qualitative assessment of contributions from, from alliance nations. Basically, because spending doesn't automatically equal capabilities, it makes sense to have a more qualitative measure. Second, NATO should really encourage specialization within the regional clusters uh, rather than across the alliance. And I understand some initial efforts to, to foster this um, are already underway, and we would applaud that. So those policy initiatives, along with the other ones that we mentioned in the paper, can make NATO more effective without adding much more in terms of cost. However, supporters of the Transatlantic Alliance should also make the extra effort to demonstrate NATO's utility to U.S. policymakers. I'll quickly go through four suggestions about how to do that. First, we need to educate policymakers about successful NATO operations, particularly in the counter-piracy area. Few American leaders know about the two ongoing NATO maritime operations, Operation Active Endeavor in the Mediterranean and Operation Ocean Shield in the Gulf of Aden and off the Horn of Africa. And they should. Second, NATO supporters should actively estimate the cost if NATO were to disappear. 
the capabilities, uh, the, cap- the capabilities NATO contributes saves the U.S. money and frees up forces for other missions. For example, when you add up the current NATO contributions in Afghanistan, in Kosovo, and the maritime efforts I just mentioned, the size of that force is basically equal to roughly half of the cuts uh, to the U.S. Army that the Pentagon will see over the next decade. Uh, in Washington, there's an old saying that goes, a billion here and a billion there, pretty soon you're talking about real money. The same principle applies here. Third, supporters should work to ensure U.S. officials explicitly uh, recognize military operations executed under NATO auspices as such. The U.S. Defense Department tends to include NATO, the NATO alliance as an afterthought in operations. Highlighting the low-profile but important contributions from NATO partners can help the, make the case for the alliance much more salient. And last, but probably most important, NATO should emphasize the value and legitimacy bestowed by NATO as a political body. NATO provides a forum where 28 democratic countries can debate the merits of possible military interventions. Especially given the state of the UN Security Council, the legitimacy bestowed by this forum is irreplaceable. In conclusion, defense matters and NATO matters. And with some judicious policy and organizational shifts, NATO can endure and stay relevant in the 21st century. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussion. Oh, Jacob, thank you very much also for sticking to the, um, the five minutes. Um, it was very interesting, your very upbeat assessment of NATO. Um, and I was wondering, since, NATO, since defence does matter, will we touch on coalitions of the willing uh, during this discussion later? Now, our third speaker um, I'd love to welcome to the podium is uh, Paul Chapman, Director of uh, the Atlantic Council of Canada, and, um, which contributed to the whole discussion debate about um, NATO defence. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Judy. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Like my colleague uh, Jake, let me just uh, recognize my co-author and uh, the past president of the Atlantic Council of Canada who helped me with this thing, uh, Colonel uh, Brian McDonald, who's uh, over there at the, at the corner. I have basically three points to, to make uh, this afternoon. The first is that uh, defense always matters. Uh, the second is that the, the challenge today is to, de- is to explain how defense matters. Uh, And the third is that NATO's problem uh, is a disagreement over its fundamental purpose, not over how to to finance the organization. If you can fix the first, you can fix the second. Okay, Uh, defense always matters. Every day we read in the headlines and watch on television the the carnage that is international politics on, on several continents. So it ought to be self-evident to democratic states that they need the wherewithal to protect themselves from the worst that the world has to offer. Strangely, the onus always seems to be, don't you notice, on the people who who, um, understand the need for defense to explain themselves, rather than the onus on on those who don't think defense is required uh, or can be done on the cheap. I think we have to reverse that, uh, that situation somehow. I think if there's a lesson at all to be learned from the 20th century, it is surely that uh, defense matters, that it, you require the wherewithal to defend yourself and to, to deter and defeat uh, aggression wherever it uh, takes place. The profound truth at the heart of NATO uh, is, is, is that defense matters. NATO itself, not necessarily the NATO organization or the NATO military structure, um, in the years before NATO, the Soviet Union annexed uh, parts of four countries. Uh, it, took control, it took control of seven other countries with a population of $92 million, and it, th- it was threatening Berlin. After NATO was created, um, and um, its members uh, promised solemnly to Moscow uh, that there would be a violent response to any Uh, future Soviet effort uh, uh, against any one of the members, the Soviet Union never made another attempt uh, on West European territory. So it's practical politics that goes back into the mists of time. If you want peace, prepare for war. Second, how defense matters. NATO is supposed to have a problem explaining why defense matters. Our studies suggest that we, we, uh, we ask a different question. When NATO faced the Red Army, 5 million soldiers, uh, um, uh, 50,000 tanks, 
people understood instinctively why a military solution was required to that problem. That's not the case today. With the Cold War over, they, they understand that, the, that you can stand down some element of your, of your military establishment. Uh, but they do know that there's other problems out there. They just, un- they just don't understand why some of those newer problems uh, require military solutions. Uh, for some, uh, it's simply too distant and abstract for them um, to explain that the, you need defense spending to deal with emerging powers or the security of sea lines of communication or the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. In other cases, dangers that people do recognize, like cyber attacks and, and uh, um, uh, terrorism, uh, they don't understand why the solutions need to be military when they know that these are being worked on by other institutions um, uh, of government. People also know something else, and that is that after 20 years of, of wars of one kind or another, um, uh, they're pretty weary of the whole enterprise. They're disappointed with the results, uh, and they're certainly shaken in some countries by the human and the, and the financial cost. So they are going to have to be mightily convinced uh, to uh, put money into military enterprises that are not demonstrably, directly, and seriously uh, designed to deal with with, uh, uh, national security uh, interests, other than I would submit uh, for peacekeeping or humanitarian purposes. So I think in our times, and it's time for a 21st century look at this issue rather than try to drag 20th century concepts into it, uh, the challenge is to educate people uh, on the part that the military play in their security writ large, uh, on the capabilities that the military require to deal with the contingencies that people uh, understand may arise, uh, and thirdly, to, to explain to them the levels of funding that certain military capabilities uh, need in order to be effective. One of the findings of our study is that people revere their military uh, when they see the military doing things for them. They'll pay for that. Last, uh, what's NATO's real problem? Uh, NATO has been hugely successful in doing job one, which was defending its members for 40 years. Since the Cold War, I would submit, um, NATO has taken on a multitude of tasks and its unity of purpose uh, has fractured. I won't explain all those tasks, but we're familiar with the whole agenda that has been worked out over the last 20 years. The strategic concept of 2010, I think, helped to clarify in some respects uh, the priorities, but I don't think it, it uh, adequately dealt with the fundamental issue, which was the division of labor, the division of, of between people who believe that the fundamental purpose of the alliance is the defense of member states and those who see the alliance with larger ambitions. I think if we can resolve that issue, and I think it is resolvable, I think we can resolve the financial issue. So in the final analysis, if you can make defense matter to people, uh, I think you can make them Uh, understand that defense actually matters to the pocketbook as well. Thank you. That was admirable. You you tried to threaten me that you'd be speaking for eight minutes, but you packed really super ideas into the five. Thank you very much. Clearly, you've opened up the whole uh, hornet's nest about how NATO sells itself as well. And our last speaker... From France, Etienne Dudoron, Senior Fellow and Director of Security Studies, Institut Français des Relations Internationales. Thank you, Etienne. For... Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first, it's a great pleasure to be there and to talk about this uh, issue. Uh, to me, and I'll talk from a decidedly French perspective, there are three obvious reasons why defense matters. The first one has to do with security. The second one has to do with self-image and identity, and the third one has to do with economics. Regarding security, of course, the, uh, the old missions of the alliance do matter. Uh, first, defend our territories, including against long-range threats. Collective defense should not be neglected, and a lot of, I mean, several member states today point that out, and they are right to do so. 
We also happen to have interests abroad, some of them uh, over fairly long distances, so we have not just to take care of our territories, but also to defend our interests, and that also is uh, quite clear to a majority of French people, if you look at the polls. But I'd like to add a third argument, which I think is very powerful and resonate on those first two arguments, and that has to do with U.S. disengagement, and I guess we would somewhat disagree here, but... Uh, whether or not uh, uh, we are right to think that U.S. disengagement is real, uh, the fact remains that it's a very powerful argument explaining why European nations would be more serious uh, in the future than they have been so far. Uh, final point regarding security, and that was pointed out earlier on by uh, Jamie Shee, defense is also, of course, a factor of international influence, and that also is quite clearly understood uh, uh, across Europe, and certainly that's the case in France. 90% of people, according to polls, understand that uh, military power is a factor of influence. Now, regarding self-image and national identity, even though this is uh, co-organized by NATO, uh, I'd like to point out that defense at the heart is national sovereignty. And so it has to do with the nation state, even more so than with alliances like NATO. Defense is a core mission of the state. Actually, permanent taxation and per the permanent military were invited at the invented, I'm sorry, at the same time in Britain, in Britain, in England, and France during the Hundred Years' War, 15th century. That's the link. That's how nations uh, were formed. So the military is the raison d'être of the state. Uh, it's also its ultima ratio, uh, including for national disasters, natural catastrophes, and stuff like that. That's quite clear, even though people tend to forget about it. Second, uh, I'm thinking of our intervention in Mali. Mali quite clearly showed that there is national pride uh, whenever uh, your military is uh, engaged in an intervention and is doing it on a national basis, or mostly on a national basis. Mali, as a mission, was much more popular and had much more support in my country than Afghanistan. And to make my point a little bit blunt, I guess, it's not just that Mali is closer to home. It's not really closer to home. Uh, it's not Sarajevo, but it's because it was a national mission uh, and the French military didn't look like the auxiliary of U.S. legions. And, you know, Afghanistan was never popular for that reason and could never be. Final point is about the economics. Uh, <clears throat> that is a powerful theme that really resonates uh, uh, with the public opinion when you explain to people what is at stake. In my country, defense amounts more or less to 165,000 direct jobs which is quite a lot. Now, if you were to take into account indirect jobs, it's kind of difficult to tell, but some people say you would have to double that number. We're talking of 15 billion uh, uh, euros uh, that are produced mostly locally with very few imports. So it's, it's quite important, not just from a technological point of view, but also from an economic point of view. The problem, of course, is uh, the budgetary situation. And I'd like to, uh, of course, I cannot really show it to all of you, but this is, these are public expenses in my country. These are social expenses, 95, 2011. This is defense. And more or less it's the same all over Europe. This is the real problem. This is what's killing defense today. So we need to have a national debate about it. Uh, and I don't think here uh, uh, NATO can directly intervene. So let me offer a few conclusions about what NATO should do in that very difficult budgetary and economic context. I think NATO should tell the truth for a change. Uh, because at the national level, we cannot really do that. National ministries will always tell you a good story. National MODs cannot tell you how deep the cuts that are on the way are. So it should be NATO's mission, first, uh, to tell the truth about not only our successes, like Jamie was saying, but also our failures along the past 20 years. Second, to tell the truth about falling European capabilities today. It's very difficult to have exact figures about it, and I think NATO would be ideally placed to do that. And third, to have a real debate. As was pointed out, uh, there is a dissensus today regarding what the core objectives of the alliance should be. We need to talk about it, and to some extent to have that debate publicly. It cannot be behind closed doors. Thank you. Etienne, thank you very much for this. I mean, the fact that if NATO needs a debate, well, you know yourself, the Europeans, the 28 different uh, defence strategies or world views, um, uh, views about defence, I mean, the whole idea of having a debate hasn't yet coalesced at the EU. We'll, we will see what happens at the Defence Summit here, uh, at the EU Defence Summit in Brussels in December. So, um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to moderate, so therefore I can't interrupt, although I would love to. However, I will just say one thing which has struck me about this debate. Everybody says defence matters, and then you know, consensus, oh yes, NATO matters. And I just wonder if defence really matters, and if it really, really matters, why is there so little pooling and sharing? Why is there no smart defence? I'm saying defence matters, but in reality it would be nice to define how it actually matters before saying, before, uh, although everybody says, yes, we've got the threats, we have to be ready, but, I mean, the public has to know why defence matters, and instead of listening to endless squabbles and pleas for smart defence, without much, I'm not going to go on about this now. Yes, wait, I, I, no, this, the, this is the format. Three or four questions, please, short, direct, identify yourself, and if necessary, please... Um, Tell, uh, tell who you want the question directed to. We have Mark Perini here. The first question here. Uh, second question over here. And I'll take one more and the third question. There's three already. Uh, Mark Perini, Carnegie Europe, uh, Usual Suspects. My question is for Mr. De Camp. Um, and it's about uh, skepticism about military operations. And it's about my Dutch neighbor, uh, who I might bump into tonight when I go back home. Uh, we currently have a NATO operation in Turkey where uh, uh, soldiers from uh, Germany, the Netherlands, and the U.S. are protecting a NATO member, according to the Charter, against uh, a rogue regime, uh, Syria. Uh, this is fully compliant with NATO policies. At the same time, we read in the press that uh, the Turks might be buying a Chinese missile defense system, which wouldn't be compatible uh, with NATO, would create risks, Uh, and uh, would perhaps undermine NATO's own missile architecture. What do I reply to my Dutch neighbor if he asks, what should I pay for this while the Turks don't reciprocate? Great question. We've got a second question over here. Please. Yeah. Thank you. I am uh, Giancarlo Chevalar. I am represented uh, here in Italian think tank, Centro Studi Federalismo. My contribution and my question is about uh, one player which has been barely mentioned during the debate, but which I think uh, is fundamental to the debate of why defense matters. I mean the European Union. Um, last week, uh, defense ministers within the European Defense Agency decided a uh, set of uh, common action, very important for, in four areas. In three weeks' time, heads of government will meet here in Bruxelles, in Brussels, to relaunch the common defense policy. Now, why uh, the European U Union is relevant to this debate? First of all, for economical reason. My think tank uh, carried a, a study, and it came out uh, about the cost of, of non-Europe in the defense area. It came out that uh, the cost, uh, such a cost, is 120 billion. Uh, so, obviously, if we join forces as a European, we can uh, be uh, spectacularly favorable to our taxpayer. But secondly, also matters the European Union, because we are carrying a number of uh, operations, small operations, of course, but uh, still they are underway for five million military operation and they are successful and they are uh, uh, successful also to our public opinion, there is no objection about it. So I suppose NATO and the European Union <coughs> should join forces okay. in this uh, debate about uh, um, how defense matters. And my question really to oh, yes. nobody in particular, but in general, is what the efforts are done uh, to this effect. Because the worst okay. thing would be for our public opinion to see NATO and the European Union getting one against the other and yes. duplicating okay. defense uh, expenditure. Thank very you. Useful. Thank you very much. The third question over here. Thank, thanks very much. Uh, I'm Adrian Croft from uh, Reuters. I had a question um, for Mr. De Caen and uh, Mr. De Durand in, in particular, but anybody else free to, um, to answer. Uh, there's a lot of talk about Europe lagging behind the United States and Israel in the development of drones or UAVs and um, some, some early steps by the European Defence Agency and the Commission to drive forward a, a project, I think, on this in, in respect to the uh, December summit. 
uh, to, to the early steps towards developing a European medium altitude long endurance drone. I want to ask you, is, is that a desirable goal, in your view, for Europe to develop its own dr drone at a time when defence budgets are tight, or would it be more efficient for European countries to continue to buy American UAVs? Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, let's start off with the China. Um, NATO Patriot Missiles China. Nothing like a good crack of a question to begin with. Please. Yeah, uh, thank you. And the link was made with the uh, what you called the NATO operation, I understand, in Turkey. I would like to stress that actually what we are doing is a deployment uh, to reinforce the uh, Turkish uh, air defense system at the request of Turkey. Uh, and hence the deployment that has taken place. Now, with regard to the Chinese system, uh, clearly uh, it is for each and every ally, uh, each and every nation, to take a decision that is within the national uh, sovereignty. And it will be uh, uh, not correct for me as an international, international staff member to uh, criticize a, uh, a NATO member state. That said, I think what is at the heart of the discussion there is interoperability because we want those systems that nations acquire at national level to be able to communicate and to be, in the case of missile defense, to be integrated in a NATO network. And uh, if there has been criticism on a potential decision, my understanding that the decision has not yet been taken, it was driven by concern of uh, that system perhaps not being able to be integrated into the NATO command and control system. Uh, there was a question on drones, uh, but I uh, will leave that to colleagues if you want. Do you want to want. come up and uh, say something about the Turkish-China uh, uh, issue? Uh, I don't think it's, uh, uh, it's made yet. Uh, pro it might be a tactic to uh, you know, get a better deal, but if really the Turks make that choice, I'd say, as a personal opinion, as an analyst, it's a terrible decision that will have consequences. Uh. Uh, uh, Jacob, did you want to say something about this? Uh, no, you don't have to. No. Mark, are you happy with that answer? Oh. Okay. Next, um, the EU, well, the perennial issue, EU, NATO. I mean, shouldn't they come together? Maybe not, maybe so. Yes, yes. I don't think there's any clear-cut answer how they're going to do it and when they're going to do it. And poor old Turkey's in the spotlight again with some other countries in NATO and some countries in the EU, Cyprus particularly. Anybody want to take on the EU, NATO? Anybody believes there'll be this proper cooperation? Ever? Never? <laughs> right. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, if I may again, uh, I'm sick and tired of uh, theological debates of the 90s regarding NATO and the EU, frankly speaking. Uh, the problem, again, is at the national level. The budgets are voted at the national level. Uh, the solutions come first at the national level, not at the collective level, and multilateralism has been used as an excuse by many, many nations to do less and less in terms of defense. So, you know, we, sh we have to, uh, 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 frankly speaking, do our job, do our homework, literally, before exploring uh, collective solutions. Uh, and the easy answer, like, well, we cannot do it at the national level anymore, we have to do it uh, collectively, uh, doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the more nations say that, the less they do. So quite clearly, first, we have to stop uh, our falling budgets and, if possible, to raise them a little bit. And then we'll see what, how we can do a, a, a effective collaboration, pragmatic cooperation. I fully agree with the chairman regarding not doing any more NH90 and that kind mm. of stuff. But first, remember, budgets are voted in national capitals, not in Brussels, whether this Brussels or the, the, next, the, mm. the one next the one. door. Do you want to come in on, this very, on the EU NATO or the Turk China? Uh, uh, NATO EU. Fine. Fine. Because I believe still today the focus of that debate is far too much on the institutional relationship between uh, NATO and the EU. But actually, the EU, as much as NATO, are nations. And so what prevents the UK, France and Germany to sit together and launch smart defense initiatives with a very heavy European footprint? Nobody would object to that. I would quote here a former Belgian prime minister who said, well, from the moment the big three France, UK, and Germany can agree on European defense, that solution is most likely going to be acceptable to most of the European nations. Mm. And I, I believe this very, is very mm. right. I agree with this. Uh, Paul, you want to pop in here? Uh, at, the, at, the, at the risk of being a little too blunt, uh, yeah, please sort it out because from a North American perspective, it's getting very tiresome. Yeah, great. Okay. 
leave it up for the next debate. Um, the drones. Um, this is the drones. We can't forget the drones. I mean, this is such a, a, a political issue in Germany. So, the, in the new uh, German political contract, um, coalition contract, they've decided not to have any drones in, in Germany or even produce them, but they may consider developing the Euro uh, hawk. We shall see about this. The drone issue, which Adrian Croft asked about. Um, pardon me? The drones, yes. Adrian, uh, there was a drone, yes. Okay. Uh, Maybe I'll start with... Uh, yes. Okay. Um, first, we have to distinguish between armed drones, the ones we are using to the surveillance platforms that, that are really uh, next to nothing in terms of air-to-air -air combat, from UCAVs, you know, next generation, you know, in 10 or 15 or 20 years from now. This is a completely different debate. Regarding armed drones, the way they are used today to zap terrorists, uh, frankly speaking, there is not, probably not a large market enough in Europe between the three or four main nations that are interested. Uh, but the reason why the industry is interested in it, to, in my understanding, is because of civilian applications, not so much because of the military market, which is very, very narrow. That might be different in the 2030s if, you know, UCAVs replace or complement armed uh, fighter jets. Uh, so two different debates here, but you need fresh money. Uh, so should we continue? Well, I think the, the French will come up with an initiative to at least coordinate uh, European buyers of, of uh, Reapers, U.S. drones, so that we can put some European or national technologies aboard those uh, birds uh, and not having to uh, ask Congress uh, uh, whenever we want to arm them or whatever. That, uh, that's the short-term issue. And here I think we should cooperate with the British, the Italians, and the Germans. But longer term, uh, it's something else. It's really about UCAF. Which are essentially saying that um, both the public, NATO, and the Europeans, they have to uh, recognise that armed drones are now going to be part of the military kit. And how to. How to I mean, I, yes, but it's not out there. I mean, you have the gut. Because of the American use of drones, I mean, they're the, un, in, the incarnation of evil, so to speak. It's how to break this down, this barrier, or change the discussion, or have a discussion about it. Yes, there, there, there are some legal aspects about. Uh, who you can kill uh, uh, abroad, okay? But whether you kill them with drones or with uh, snipers, uh, it's, it's, it, it, it has acquired a great deal of political visibility, but from a legal point of view, uh, there's not, not, not that much of a distinction, frankly speaking. Uh, anyway, for us today, our drones are not armed, so it's really a surveillance platform, and, and when, whenever we need to take out people, we, we use planes or whatever. So there's not much, I mean, this is a U.S. debate, as I understand it, maybe a German one, but not so much in the rest of Europe, as I can tell. There's a debate in Britain about this. Please, audience, if you have any views on the drones, uh, do let me know. There's, I'm going for the second round of questions now. Uh, oh, one, two, three. There's four questions. I'll take those four hands at the moment. There's the first one, second, third, and fourth. Please. <coughs> Uh, Mustafa Kibarolu, Professor of International Relations from Turkey. And, uh, uh, salut. Um, I need to make a few points of clarification with respect to the question that was just asked about Turkey's decision. First and foremost, uh, do you have to protect Turkey while they are, you know, Turks are buying some systems from China? Yes, you must, as part of Article 5. Sorry for that. Um, uh, the points of clarification, uh, yes, the process is not over yet, but no, it's not a tactic. I can tell you this from my conversation with the very high up people. It's only up to the Chinese to defer, and Turks are really committed to get through. And unless Chinese uh, fail to deliver, this process is likely to be accomplished in the next few years. There are two points, two criteria which should be underscored here. Uh, one is uh, Chinese have promised to make operational within the next few years up to nine battalions uh, operable, uh, and they will be deployed all over Turkey, especially the eastern and southeastern part. Second, uh, they will share know-how, technology. None of Turkey's allies in the West, U.S. and Europeans, uh, agreed to this, these points. And had it been the case uh, from their part, Turkey would have possibly ch uh, chosen the uh, French or American or other systems. And uh, last point, actually, this is something that... Uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the Turks are really committed to, uh, you know, invest in defense industries. The building itself was increased, um, you know, much bigger premises now, five or six times bigger, and now there are many more personnel and lots of budgets invested in the defense industry. So uh, that might something increase the appetite of uh, uh, European allies for the next uh, sort of uh, bidings. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's questions over there. Um, uh, behind you there, and 
and the other person there, yeah. And there was somebody else over there too. Uh, good afternoon, Eyüp Can Dervişoğlu from Turkish delegation to NATO. And I thank uh, Professor Kibaroğlu for uh, his uh, comments. I was about to make the same comments. Actually, first and foremost, there is no NATO operation going on in Turkish territory. It's just support uh, to Turkish air missile defense system. That's one point. Regarding the Chinese systems, actually, Professor Kibaroğlu has pointed out three important points, but let me reiterate them. First, this decision is not over yet. Second, it is much more about technology transfer. It's much more about uh, the price. So in that regard, the French analysts comment about the tactics and it's being terrible. I don't think that it's uh, just an easy buy like that because thinking that all the procurements that we had in the past and they're being blocked in senates or the parliaments and I don't think that it was a, too terrible. But if our French colleague thinks that it's a terrible thing to do so, then they might choose to do so. Thank you. Very much. Um, it, excuse me, that gentleman, yes, there on your left. And there's a gentleman at the back. And we we'll take that question from Alex Nickel, the last one. Good. No, no, no. It was that gentleman there on your left. Yes. And then the gentleman behind you on your right. Yes. Thank yes. You. My name is Alessandro Gallo from uh, YPFP, who doesn't know that uh, stands for Young Professor in Foreign Policy. Yeah. My question, if I'm allowed to uh, come question. back on the EU-NATO issue, uh -huh. uh, not staying on the matter of financial issue, but more on political side, um, I started thinking that uh, sooner or later there will be a treaty revision in the European Union. <coughs> uh, new issues will be uh, um, deal with, the, with, with, with this discussion. And one yeah. of the, these issues should be, sooner or <coughs> later, security. My question is to know, what do you think will be the space of NATO towards the EU, not vice versa? Because the EU needs to refine its space of intervention. There is a technical problem at a certain point. Some, sta some member states of the European Union cannot join a military alliance. I think about Sweden, Finland, Ireland, and so on. Okay. But NATO should uh, uh, go in the direction of a political union for Europe. Do you think this is feasible, and what's the space for this uh, action? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. I just want to remind the audience that this, uh, remember the, the title of the, of the discussion, Defence Matters. Uh, yes, please. Hi, my name is Asla Toya. I work for the Norwegian Noble Institute. First of all, uh, let me offer uh, the panel a critical question, and oh. that is okay. questioning the entire uh, the concept. Is it really the problem in NATO and defence that we haven't had enough communication? I would put it to you that perhaps... We have had too many initiatives and too many conferences uh, and that the problem with uh, defence spending is not a lack of a communication strategy but a lack of a, of a threat. And a question to the most interesting point made by the panellists to my mind was Etienne Durand. Your point about uh, flying the flag in Mali, it seems to be the antithesis to smart defense, because what we're being told is that we're supposed to give up the flag, let's pull it, that's the future, whilst you seem to be saying that that is the way to certain death. And I would like you to, to comment upon that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I didn't see everybody rushing to put the flags in Mali when the French went in. Um, Alex Nickel, please. Yeah, thank you, Judy. Uh, uh, Alex Nickel from the IISS. Uh, my question is for Mr. Stokes, um, because he raised the interesting question of whether there are more qualitative benchmarks uh, that you can use in measuring defence spending. Uh, I think, you know, if, if one could do that, it certainly would change the nature of the debate about defence matters. Mm. Uh, so I wonder if you might like to elaborate a little bit on, on what you mean by that, and I wonder whether other members of the panel might have any views on that. Okay, five good questions. Well, actually, three good questions, because we had two about Turkey. Um, I'd like to work backwards. The quality of defence issue, um, uh, Jacob, if we could look at this, the benchmarks, are, are we addressing it in the correct manner? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, uh, it, to exp you know, inputs are not outputs, right? And so um, to measure what you're, what you're, just what you're putting in um, doesn't account for some nations that actually might be better at delivering the services that the, you know, and the capabilities that the alliance actually needs and that are useful, um, possibly at a lower cost. I mean, in the U.S. debate, we talk about this a lot of, okay, how can we, you know, improve our business practices? How can we be more efficient? And really, how can we measure the outputs rather than just the money spent? Um, so I think that more, dis, you know, broad 
broad public discussion about that can actually bring some of the more efficient military establishments uh, some of the credit for their efforts that they probably deserve um, that are aside from just how much money they put in. Okay, Thank, thanks for that. Hmm, what's the problem with NATO? <laughs> Paraphrasing um, who, um, the gentleman from the Nor Norwegian Institute. I mean, is it too many summits? Anybody want to take on this question? Does NATO have a problem? Um, the Norwegian, uh, our Norwegian colleague who's asking, you know, what is the problem with NATO? Is it doing too much communication? Does it have a raise on debt? I mean, please uh, correct me if I'm paraphrasing, but any time I dare mention to senior NATO diplomats, you know, is there a problem with NATO? <sighs> it's bad news. No, everything's fine. <laughs> please, Etienne. Okay, if I, if I may. Uh, yes, I do think you're right, actually, on both counts. Uh, first, uh, we tend to speak to ourselves. Of course, I mean, when NATO organizes a conference about why defense matters, we're all convinced that defense matters in this room. And we should be talking to people who are not convinced, and especially the general public, the general readership of the press. Uh, and here we have to get less, probably less technical, uh, less detailed. Uh, uh, but yes, we, we are, you know, aiming at the wrong target. Second, yes, you're also absolutely right that uh, there is a contradiction or at least a tension between smart defense or pooling and sharing or whatever, and the reality, which is, again, that the budget, defense budgets are, uh, are decided at the national level, and it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's a national decision. And, and because we've put collective so-called solutions uh, so much uh, in front, people tend to believe that actually the EU or NATO, the general guy in the street does not really know the difference, has an answer for that. Well, NATO will take care of it, but NATO won't take care of anything because budgets and armies are still national. And uh, final point, if I may yeah, get back on the Turkish uh, issue and missile defense. I say terrible because obviously uh, uh, if ever you buy Chinese, uh, uh, your system won't be compatible with Western systems. It's as simple as that because of code issues. Uh, and second, I understand what you say about the price, but you should also pay attention to the fact that the Chinese system is actually a downgraded version <coughs> of a Russian system. So it's also a question, I mean, you know, do, we, do you want quality or not? I would put it bluntly like that. Could we have the microphone, uh, the Turkish diplomat from NATO, could we have the microphone there? He's getting very um, excited about this. Thank you. Well, sorry to come back once no, again. No, please. But uh, we are talking why defense matters here. And while talking why defense matters, uh, one of the important points that all speakers has, uh, has emphasized was the defense industrial complex. And we are also talking about the being smart in defense and defense expenditures. <clears throat> in that regard, uh, though our first point is that this process has not been finalized yet, I'm sure when putting out the bid or when uh, drafting the technical requirements, my authorities have done their best to ensure that, that the systems that they may be procuring are in fact would be compatible with the command and control systems. <coughs> on the other hand, on the other hand, uh, being smart as well also means the price. So in, with all those things, I don't think that uh, the French analyst analysis <coughs> was reflecting the total picture of the issue. That being said, <coughs> I'll just give a full stop to this issue here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we wanted to go back to the... Uh, yes, please. Uh, Jody, if, if yeah. I may, there was a question about do we have a problem at NATO? Is, is there mm. something wrong with our concept? I think the NATO concept is still very sound and valid. Uh, if you have a good understanding of what that concept is, and actually at the heart of the concept is consensus decision-making. And as soon as you have a consensus decision among 28 uh, sovereign nations that we need to do something collectively because their collective security interests are at stake, then you may have a NATO operation or a NATO action, or you have may, uh, uh, NATO spending on common funding and so on. So I think that is still very much a sound, a very sound concept, and which also provides an answer, I think, to the question, what is the NATO space? Well, NATO will go where the 28 nations will decide it to go. <coughs> of course, the challenge is, in, in a very unpredictable environment, how do you... 
procure and provide the tools that you need to support such consensus decision making. I think that is at the heart of the discussion here. But the concept per se, I think, is still very okay. Well, I mean, you go, uh, we, could, we could have had this answer 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, consensus, lowest common denominator. Uh, the fact is there are coalitions of the willing now, not NATO acting as a collective alliance. We've seen this in Libya. Uh, we don't even talk about uh, Mali. Um, we have very different aspects of, of the missions. There are shared concepts of threats. It, these are big um, political issues. Are you going to disagree? Well, please. I, I don't agree uh, because, yes, coalitions of the wedding, we have seen that, but at certain points, uh, point in time, NATO have taken collectively the political responsibility for those operations. Not always as a first option, I very much agree. NATO was not the first option in the Balkans, it wasn't the first option in Afghanistan, and it wasn't the first option of, of, of Libya. But that is also a telling story, that after uh, launched an operation as a coalition of the winning, 28 nations came to the conclusion that they had to bring that operation into the NATO environment under the political authority and benefiting from the integrated NATO military command structure as a key element contributing to the success of that operation. And I think that is very much at the heart of, of NATO. So we are not in NATO having a model for conducting coalitions of the winning. They happen outside NATO. But what we have seen in the past that these coalitions of the winning come towards NATO because it makes sense to do it in a collective manner. Well, this brings us uh, back yet again to our main topic, defence matters. It, it's quite interesting, the, the ambiguity of matters. Um, so we're going to the third round of questions. And uh, yes, I'll just wait to make sure, because the lights are very strong. Number one here, number two, and number three. And number four. Okay, please. Thank you. Patrick Kozakiewicz from IB Consultancy. Uh, there's a lot of mention of cyber maritime missile defense threats. What about uh, CBRNE threats? Would you shed some light into uh, why these threats matter and if they matter for NATO? Could you tell the audience what the, that this is, please? Uh, chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear and explosive threats. Terrific. Thank you very much. And we had it over here and then at the back. Yes. And yes. Alessandro Marrone, Istituto Affari Internazionali, Rome. I'm one of the co-author yes. of one of the eight report of the Defense Matter Project. Uh, I will make the question to the three speakers from the three think tanks. In your view, which are the two NATO operations which enjoyed more support in your country? Hmm. And if the three couples do not, does not match, what, could you elaborate why there is this divergence of support in terms of which operation is more important? And just a footnote, I agreed with uh, Dr. De Durand that the decision had taken at national <coughs> level, but himself made an example of drones to be procured by French, Germans, Brits, and Italians, and so far and so on. So the, the decision is national, budget, but the national budget alone is not sufficient, so you need a cooperative program among Europeans. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the question that was... Um, uh, yes, over here, please. Uh, back, yes, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, Mario Nicolini, Slovakia, MOD's Institute for Security and Defense Studies. I think we uh, have not only a public opinion problem with the public at large, we also have a political elite problem uh, having a, a cross-government support for defense expenditure. Does this change in any way the nature of our discussion and what arguments would then be different according right. to our speakers. Thank you. That's an interesting question. And we had a speaker, uh, question over here, uh, uh, near the, the Norwegian colleague. Thank you. Oh, I won't forget the question. Henrik Breitenbauer with the Center for Military Studies in uh, Copenhagen. Uh, my question, I think, is uh, first and foremost to Ludwig, uh, but uh, everyone else is welcome to join, of course. Um, um, we've seen several speakers emphasize the role of, uh, of the nation and the national perspective on, uh, on defense matters, but, but also several speakers emphasized the, the need for multinational solutions, for example, in multinational procurement. But don't we have a conundrum here that is a structural issue that we cannot really solve by any conceptual means? It, isn't it so that we cannot really ever overcome this problem unless we have, for example, one unified industrial defense base across yeah. the, uh, the, the Atlantic, basically? Um, don't we have a problem here that's not yeah. really solvable? So that leads me to the second part of the question is, are we doomed? And to Etienne specifically, is Europe doomed then? Mm -hmm. Is Europe doomed? <clears throat> um, I think we leave the... Uh, this is a, a super question. Uh, I'd like to leave the last, that 
for the, for the last. Can we deal, go back the other way around now, chemical, the chemical biological um, weapons issue, how this feeds into the discussion. Uh, what your, your exact question was? Uh, yes. Well, we've seen this with Syria, of course. Um, who would like to take up whether the chemical, biological weapons threats, but these are conceived as threats, do they matter? Sure. Thanks, Jim. Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, I mean, you know, certainly uh, the U.S. spends a, a huge amount of, of time and effort uh, preparing for these, and, and you know, particularly um, looking at the case of Syria, where, you know, what was the emphasis there uh, as far as what was the biggest problem for U.S. interests was, you know, the, the use of chemical weapons, and obviously uh, the broad non-proliferation regime is, you know, extremely high on the list. Um, and I think that uh, because those preparing for those types of threats requires such a uh, high level of technical proficiency, that actually makes a lot of sense uh, for uh, increased NATO um, cooperation on that front. So. Thank you. Um, the level of support in various countries for the operations, um, I don't know if you were expecting an answer to that, are you? Does any, or, I, I haven't actually seen the breakdown of the studies, how each country perceives operations, unless you have any succinct assessment. Pardon me? Sp some speakers have oh, made references about the fact that, for example, Mali, Mali operations oh, yes. was appreciated in much France. Yes, yes. I wanted to ask to the three of them which NATO operations have had more, have matters more in their country to see if there is yeah. a convergence or not. Yeah, thank you. Hmm. <clears throat> Thanks. Let me kind of tackle the, 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 a broader issue in which maybe that, that issue could be, could be looked at. <coughs> The NATO consists of 28 countries. Every single one of those countries has to be convinced in its own way for its own reasons to spend money on defense. If we jump too quickly to uh, uh, proposals for uh, doing it in the, in the collective, uh, doing it uh, more efficiently, if for effectively across cooperative ventures, uh, I, I, think we're, I think we're missing a couple of fundamental steps that, are, that have to be dealt with first. In our paper, uh, we quoted um, rather flippantly a comment from uh, one of our most distinguished professors of defense management studies, where we said, defense matters when it matters, and it doesn't matter when it doesn't matter. What we really meant by that was, uh, if you look at Canada's uh, behavior over, say, 50, 60 years, uh, our defense spending has gone up and down like the, like the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and there's an explanation for why it goes up, and there's an explanation for why it goes down. And it goes up when people see tangible, tangible and demonstrable reasons uh, for the need to defend themselves and to support their military who are defending them. Uh, when when these, 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 these dangers uh, begin to dissipate and disappear altogether, uh, it's hard sometimes for... Uh, governments who themselves are a reflection of the population to understand that you better not let the, the, the drop be too precipitous or too deep because it's going to go back up some point, sometime and as time goes on it's more and more costly and, and difficult to, to, to re-establish what you went to great pains to establish once before and then let, uh, let atrophy. So one of the theses of our study, one of the, a message that really came, came across from a Canadian perspective, which I think has broader NATO application, <laughs> is, is that individual governments have to feel, and the populations have to feel, a stake in mm -hmm. the defense. And my own personal view is that uh, we have seen in Canada a stake in our defense, uh, certainly in Afghanistan, our budget went from $10 billion to $22 billion in about 12 years. That's a doubling. I don't think any performance anywhere in NATO matched that. And there was only one reason, and that was Canadians saw their, their, their troops in Afghanistan under-equipped, under-trained, uh, under-armed, uh, and they, needed, they, they, they got mad at the government and they forced changes in the system. Now, I think... I think if, if you, one of, one of the, the, the key aspects of our study is to conclude that maybe in Europe there isn't enough connection between defense spending and homeland defense. If you, and I think this is kind of what's behind the French notion of, of, of national dignity and so on. If people saw their, their uh, defense money 
going to, to uh, military forces that are doing something for them. Uh, I don't think you have a hard sell at all. But if you try to, try to make the case that, 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 that's, that's more abstract and theoretical, mm. I, I think you fall flat. So mm. one way or the other, we think Europeans should be more involved in the defense of Europe. And I think that might motivate um, uh, a, a change in attitude about this whole issue. Paul, I think it's, it's really, it's actually very important what you're saying. First of all, it deals with the question, the gap between uh, the, the public opinion elites and the, and the political elites. I think you've touched on this in some ways. And, and what is interesting is that the Canadian contribution and the Danish contribution to Afghanistan actually was underplayed by, by Europe. By generally, it's always the, 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 the British or the Americans or maybe some other forces. But um, the... the the issue which... Just, just may, maybe add a, yes. add a comment there, and that, that, that gets to Jake's point, which is how you measure contributions. Um, our traditional uh, contribution or defense spending was 1.1, 1.2% of GDP. It's now up to 1.4, 1.5, which is comparable to German defense spending. But that's, a, that's an into, input measure, as Jake um, uh, indicates. And the, the fact of the matter is some NATO members are able to go out and do things in expeditionary. Canada only does expeditionary, in a sense. Yes. Um, so to, to, we might underspend by some kind of... Uh, uh, remember, in, in, when, when you're looking at averages, everybody is, half of everybody is below average. Yeah. Uh, so you, 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 you can't win that game. So I think we do need to be a bit yeah. more clever about how we calculate. Yeah. Uh, now, um, we're going on to the next set of questions. I want to uh, follow up Paul's point. How do you sell this to the public that defence matters? Well, actually, the former president uh, of Germany, Horst Köhler, he actually said defence matters because um, uh, the German contributions to the Horn of Africa, the, the, the operation uh, there, was actually protecting German shipping lanes. Economic interests. He had to resign. They didn't want to hear the truth. There is a, a connection between defence and economy and trade and security. They're all tied. And that, the German public opinion did not want to accept this. I just throw this out, that how do you sell this defence? You have to tell the hard truth. And, you know, some big countries in NATO are not yet ready for it. Our next batch of questions... Um, yes, please, Etienne. Did anybody want to say... Yes, yes. Just quickly about WMDs. I think you have to distinguish between terrorist attacks using you know, radioactive elements or chemicals or whatever, threats on deployed troops abroad in a coalition during an operation like Syria might have been, and direct threat to the national territory, in which case for us, it would fall under nuclear deterrence. Right. So those three things are very different, and the answers would be very different. National deterrence, as, it, as the name implies, is mostly national. Uh, even though NATO might be involved uh, in some respect, uh, and Defense Against Terrorist Act is also done mostly at the national level. So NATO should probably, its added value would be at the, uh, for expeditionary missions against proliferators. Here there is a lot to be done that should be done. Uh, to answer the question about which operations are most popular, if that is the, the point, it's, uh, it's really a guesstimate more than anything else. I don't have polls to prove that. Uh, I, I, the only poll I have in mind is the, the one about Mali, but I think in the French case, Mali comes first, then NATO interventions or interventions in general in the Balkans in the 90s, and Af Afghanistan is a distant third. Uh, and I, I wouldn't be surprised that more or less it, it's the case all over Europe. Final point about the uh, national defense. Uh, yeah. there, are, there is, of course, a difference of perspective between the countries that still have a national defense industry yeah. and the majority of NATO countries which don't. Uh, and, and here, I mean, the two points of view are not completely, I mean, you cannot reconcile them completely. So from a French perspective, obviously, uh, uh, I mean, we, when, when you look at European countries, the, most of the time the ones that spend the most are the ones that do have a defense industry, and there is a link, obviously. Uh, and no, we won't see a unified uh, defense industry across Europe because, you know, why should BAE or... Uh, Airbus commit suicide on behalf of the other or on behalf of German industry or whatever. Uh, yeah. And competition is not necessarily a bad thing exactly, yes. Uh, so there are some things that can be done in common and yes, sometimes, you know, like for drones, probably it would be better to uh, uh, join 
uh, whenever the, there is not enough money or, or whenever the national order is just too small. However, don't forget that NH90, I mean, the, the many versions are due to the, the fact that we've added, uh, added a, a specification. So it's already difficult between the three services at the national level. Now, when you bring in all the services of all the militaries in NATO or in <coughs> Europe, it's a big mess. Uh, so... As a rule of thumb, I would offer this, the most successful projects, cooperative projects over the past 30 or 40 years have involved a limited number of nations, three yeah. or four. Whenever it's like 20 or 15, it's a mess. So again, let's be pragmatic. It's not all national, it's not all collective. Uh, let's see what works, uh -huh. uh, and let's not try and do Europe uh, for the sake of Europe with defense. Let's do defense, and final point, I'm sorry, yes, no, no. I'm too long, no, no. about the, the need to communicate. We need to, to engage the public. In my own country, most people think that the defense budget is the first budget of the state. I've showed you the reality. Yeah. It's not the, f the first, it's the fifth by far. You know? uh, so we have to engage the public because ultimately this is no longer the 1960s. It's not Charles de Gaulle making decisions. The, the people making decisions look at the polls. Yeah. So we have to convince the people. Ludwig, will you try to be brief? Before? Very, very quickly on um, the... Yes. But I believe it was an interesting question that came from, the, uh, I believe, a Norwegian colleague yes. about what he uh, referred to as the conceptual conundrum between, on exactly. the one hand, national sovereignty, Good. on the other hand, pushing for more multinational cooperation. I believe that both goes to go together quite well in the current environment because, actually, I think we come to the conclusion that if, and this applies to almost all allies, I believe, if you want to keep a level of national sovereignty, there's no other option than to achieve this true multinational cooperation. Now, this might, might, might seem a, a paradox, but it isn't. Because look at your, the capabilities that you need to exercise that sovereignty and the economic dimension. You need a minimum critical mass to get those expensive uh, pro projects launched in Europe. And that critical mass, I'm afraid to say, you do not find anymore in single nations. That is why we miss the boats, Europeans miss the boats on the drones. We don't have advanced European drones because we were not able to combine national programs into a multinational program providing sufficient critical mass to have an economically viable and sustainable okay. capability. And so I think this okay. is it. One example of how through multinational cooperation you can procure the means that then ultimately will allow you to keep your sovereign decision making. <sighs> well, you're trying, yeah, you're, is, you're, trying to have both, you're trying to have it both ways. Because we saw this debate last year with BAE systems and EADS. We knew, we knew potentially what this would mean for the idea of European security and defence. But how, this is, I Judy, mean, I, Judy, how many operations have taken place over the last two decades that were purely national uh, operations, purely national. Most of them, if not all, were multinational operations, either by design mm. or by de facto. Also by de facto development on, on the ground. Etienne, you're getting very agitated here. I thought I was getting agitated. Yeah, 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 I have to disagree. I mean, in Mali, let's be frank about it, our best allies were the US in the air and the Chadians on the ground. I mean. No, but it's not NATO, it's not exactly. the EU. I mean, let's, and, and when you look even at EU operation like Artemis in 2003, 80% of the capabilities were provided by the French. So, you know, sometimes multinationality is a cloak to get legitimacy, not necessarily because you need the capabilities, and the U.S. has done that and has enrolled the Fijis and others to have a great multinational coalition. We all know that. Second, about, you know, the need to cooperate, and that's the only way to, to save sovereignty. Again, when you look at the past 15 years, it's quite the contrary. The more people say that, the less they do at the national level. Zero multiplied by zero is zero. Yeah. That's the problem. Uh, Ludwig, uh, let's, let's have one, uh, remember the title. <laughs> okay? We've got three questions, so they better be good. Three questions. One over here. Uh, did you ask one already? Did you ask one already? Oh, no, okay. Fine. One, number one, uh, 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 number two, and is there a third one? If not, it's fine. We can have two very good questions. Okay, please. A question. Uh, thank you. A question. It is defense matters. And who are you? But uh, I believe... Uh, who are you? We are, I will tell. Uh, we are discussing... <laughs> no, who are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Velizar Shoman of NATO Communication Information Agency. Oh. So from NATO. Oh. Okay, I believe... Okay, question. The... Question. Question. <laughs> Defense matters, but behind this, behind this is actually NATO matters as well. And what I'm hearing in this discussion is uh, 
capabilities are important and success in operations are important. How high in the agenda in different nations is uh, the value of NATO for better capabilities and success in operations, Value, okay. most of them in multinational. Thank okay, you. Super, thank you. That was a very short question. Really, thank you. Uh, uh, we have somebody uh, who's over here for everything. Oh, yes, please. I'm Istvan Kovac from the Hungarian Ministry, former NATO ambassador Good. for Hungary. And, uh, of course, defense matters. But uh, I would ask the panel, does smart defense matters mm -hmm. and EU's pooling and sharing matters? Uh, mm -hmm. especially in view of December meeting mm -hmm. at the EU. And just uh, to reciprocate a little bit the bluntness of our ca Canadian colleague that uh, they're a little bit fed up with Europe from North America. Uh, I don't want to say you know, from this side, but uh, if we are talking about uh, Britain, France and Germany, and we would say that uh, France first and Germany first, that would be a problem. And for communication, please communicate with the members of parliament of each country. Okay. Hmm. A tall order, this. Um, um, I, let's, let's just briefly deal with uh, the do NATO capabilities matter. Better give the right answer. Do NATO capabilities matter? That was the, I mean, I can make a quick comment. Please. So I think a lot of the discussion has been focused on uh, developing and procuring new yes. technologies, but I think that there should also be a discussion about simply purchasing a lot of the technologies that already exist, that are off the shelf from different producers across the world that NATO needs, right? Um, and, you know, they may not be the newest, most high-end capabilities, but if they're essential things, um, you know, that, that has to be part of it as well. And just one thing about this, when some countries do want to buy from the U.S., those markets are not available. That equipment is, isn't available for, some, for, for certain reasons. Um, well, yeah, I mean, there's, there are certain things that, um, that so. we can't sell. And, you know, and I think that there's, the administration has been working on a... <laughs> The administration has been working on export reform, and it's something that, that I think in the U.S. public debate is actually growing as a topic. Um, so if there's more push from, from Europe on that, I think that would probably I think welcome. the Brits have been trying to do this for many, many decades with the Americans over certain systems. Now, this is a tricky question from a Hungarian. Um, does pooling and sharing matter, and does smart defense matter? He's only joking, of course. But, uh, I mean, it's a, I'm not so sure what, the, what, uh, what your point of your question was since NATO believes uh, smart defence matters and the EU believes pooling and sharing matters and we're not getting any fair in both, really. So does it really matter? Anyway, please, uh, no? Okay. Anybody want to comment on this? Uh, it all depends. Uh, if uh, pooling and sharing is a way to advance the unification of Europe, then, to me at least, you're getting things wrong. Defense should be the objective, not the means to an end, okay? So first, if we do our homework, again, at the national level in terms of budget, then it's possible to engage in meaningful cooperative projects, whether they are at the EU or NATO level, I don't care. Or ad hoc, I absolutely don't care. Hmm. Uh, I, you know, interesting. Let's, let's put an end to all hmm. those theological debates of the 90s. We don't have the luxury for that today, but, I would um, offer. Uh, um, and let me just point out uh, in, in parallel, the, uh, I'm disturbed by arguments that, that the, you know, the, the growth of defense industry should be a rationale for uh, defense spending. Once again, the, the, the point of the exercise is, is uh, military capability at lowest possible cost. And we have a terrible habit in Canada of, of applying all kinds of other criteria other than providing the troops with high quality equipment at the lowest cost. Uh, and we're looking at the prospect right now of acquiring uh, a, a whole fleet of new um, uh, naval vessels, each of which may cost two to three to four times what they cost in Europe. And, and that, that, I think, is, is, is unconscionable. <coughs> yes, of course. Well, uh, you could look at it from this perspective. If the experience shows over the last 20 years that all our operations are international, multinational operations, not always NATO operations, but international by design and by their own nature. Why is it that the capabilities to support these operations should be developed still through national processes? Uh, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, it would make much more sense if right from the beginning 
this would be part of a multinational approach so that by design you develop capabilities to work together. And so, yes, some smart defense matters from that perspective. Hmm. So you want to work backwards, Etienne? Yeah. Uh, last, unfortunately, last uh, let's take the example of Mali once again. When we have to ask for the authorization of the Bundestag to get tankers up in the air to help us out, that's a problem because there is, there, you know, for military operations, uh, the time is of the essence. So it's not all about building consensus. I'm sorry. This is not how it works. That's why you need to keep some capabilities at the national level. That's why you cannot share everything. And countries that have done that, and I could you know, have names in mind, actually have take adva taken advantage of that to cut sharply their defense spending. But and they no longer have any military sovereignty. No, and sovereignty I think you, make, you need to make a difference, and I'm not suggesting that okay. everything should be done through NATO, but you need to make a difference between developing your capabilities together and operating these capabilities. You have multinational yes. programs yeah. that deliver national yes. capabilities, yeah. but they are compatible yeah. with other yeah. capabilities. Just one thing, that's completely different from what he's saying about Mali. To be fair to Germany, Yes. No, we don't. Let's to be start. fair, yes, we can. To be fair to Germany, if there was a political will, if there was a phone call from Hollande to Merkel, please, can you do it? She, she would have got the, uh, the cabinet decision and the Bundestag. It, it demands political le leadership. And not once has the Bundestag rejected the extension, uh, continuing the mandate to Afghanistan. I'm just saying, for this political leadership, you can put an awful lot through. And the Bundestag generally has been pretty pretty um, systematic on pushing things to you and Hollande, Hollande and Merkel have to get on a bit better and it will be okay then. Anyway, we have to wrap up this. Um, I didn't mean that. Um, first of all, it was a great panel. Thank you very much. I learned a lot. Uh, I want to uh, uh, thank uh, Paul Chapman, Ludwig de Camps, Etienne Durin and Jacob Stokes. Thank you very, very much. And a wonderful audience. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>